Welcome back to the um, biophysical techniques um, lectures. Um, obviously, using the word thermodynamics in the title has put people off as there uh, don't seem to be so many participants. Um, nevertheless, I will continue. Um, and today's talk, um, I'm going to divide into roughly three um, equal areas. I'm, I'm going to talk about biological thermodynamics because this is quite interesting and it has impact on many areas of our work, not only um, in terms of biophysical measurement, but other areas um, such as protein purification um, um, and handling of um, systems and samples. I'm going to talk then about biological calorimetry as a general area and at the um, third half of the uh, part of the talk I'll talk about practical um, ITC measurement. So the interesting thing that I'm trying to draw your attention to here is that pretty well all of the biology that we're interested in um, in this building um, or in any other um, research institute engaged in structural biology, all um, of the processes we're interested in are a uh, result from many many um, weak and non-covalent interactions being formed and um, because these are non-covalent interactions they can be formed um, and they can also be broken. So in this way um, most of the biology that we might be interested in is based around some sort of reversible um, equilibrium process. So the simplest kind of um, equilibrium process we could consider within biology might be um, the folding and unfolding of a, a, a protein or protein interacting with a ligand, in this case, a piece of nucleic acid. Um, and and uh, under any particular set of conditions, we have a steady state and there's no net change in the concentration of these um, components of the equilibrium. So therefore the reaction position, which is then going to determine our biological effect, can be described by an equilibrium constant, which is simply the ratio of the concentrations of the products and the reactants of the equilibrium we're considering. Um, and these equilibria are also determined in a kinetic sense um, by the ratio of the forward and the reverse rate constants. So you can see that you can define an equilibrium for protein folding as being simply the ratio between the concentration of the denatured and the native molecule. Um, and for this binding um, reaction, we have an association constant, which is then um, the reciprocal of the dissociation constant, which is the ratio of the products, which is this complex over the reactants and determined by the on and the off rates. So we then come to um, a description of where this equilibrium is and um, the Gibbs free energy, which of course we've all heard of before, is really just a logarithmic representation of where this equilibrium is poised. So here you can see the formula, we've introduced a couple of constants or uh, the gas constant and we're including temperature um, and then it's the log of this equilibrium constant um, that gives us the Gibbs free energy and the Gibbs free energy also has components of enthalpy um, and entropy as seen here in this formula and if we're thinking about what the reaction is going to do um, when delta g the Gibbs free energy is negative then the log of the equilibrium constant must be a positive number. So the equilibrium constant itself is greater than one and therefore the products are in an excess. This is why for reactions to proceed towards products, um, we need to have a negative delta G. And just as a back of an envelope type of calculation, you may be in talks and people often um, express the effect of mutation um, perhaps in terms of protein stability. And as a rule here um, at 25 degrees, um, we have um, RT is equal to 0 0.59 kcals per mole. 
And to get an order of magnitude change in equilibrium constant, uh, we need to change the log by 2.303. This is sort of magic um, conversion between uh, logarithm LOG and natural log. Um, so therefore the product of these two terms, uh, or the, sorry, these two numbers is 1.36 kcals per mole. So when you get that change in um, free energy, you're changing the equilibrium position by an order of magnitude. So what are enthalpy and entropy that we just discussed? Well, this is a very simplified view, but generally a macroscopic system will naturally progress to as low an internal energy level as possible. This corresponds to a lower enthalpy. And so therefore, where we get the opportunity um, to lower the enthalpy, um, we have a negative um, enthalpy which will contribute to the reaction occurring in the direction we're interested in, which is towards the products. And heat is given off um, in a so-called exothermic process and the product is favoured. However, systems will naturally want to have as many ways of configuring, if you like, with the same energy levels. Um, and so statistically, if you can achieve a particular energy level um, um, in as many different ways as possible, then that um, arrangement of energy levels will be the most likely. And temperature is going to modulate this probability function um, through thermal motion. So the molecules progress to as lower internal energy as possible, giving off heat and favoring the reaction. However, the molecules also want are moving around under thermal energy and they will um, in effectively come back out of this energy well or elevate to a certain extent where they can have as many different ways of um, configuring with the same energy level. So entropy is a measure of the number of ways of arranging a system energy. And therefore a positive um, change in entropy is favorable in that it's mon um, factored by this negative T term. So a positive entropy, more ways of configuring will contribute negatively to the free energy. So where does our equilibrium of interest end up? Well, simply it's the balance of the enthalpy and the entropy process. Temperature is definitely a key factor because it's kind of amplifying, if you like, the entropy term. And you can achieve a, a negative or a favorable free energy, even when the enthalpy or the entropy are actually unfavorable, providing the other component of the free energy um, is um, larger. So you can see here that the equilibrium will progress towards products, even in areas where we have unfavorable entropy or enthalpy. Then we could think about these um, the, uh, the enthalpy and the um, entropy of our equilibrium, equilibrium process and wonder whether these are fixed terms. Well, in biological equilibria in particular, there are changes often in conformation, for example, here in an unfolding reaction, um, and also changes in solvation, um, which arise um, during complex formation. Solvation changes will obviously occur here, but here we have a structured chain and then a disordered chain. So both conformation and solvation changes affect the system heat capacity. That is the energy that's needed to increase the temperature of the system, either the uh, products or the reactants, by one Kelvin. The units of that are calories per mole per degree. And biological reactions have very or have large changes in heat capacity because of often the participation of solvent or these conformational changes. And the integral of heat capacity in the context of enthalpy or the integral of heat capacity divided by temperature for entropy from zero Kelvin up to the temperature that we're considering, this actually represents the um, energy levels of the um, system. And because of the significant um, change in heat capacity in biological equilibria, um, this means that the corresponding values of enthalpy 
and entropy, and therefore also the free energy um, or the equilibrium constant become very temperature dependent. And the entropy and the free energy are dependent in a non-linear manner. Here you can see that the enthalpy is varying linearly with um, temperature, but the other components are varying in a non-linear manner. And this has some interesting consequences um, in terms of what we might want to think about in a, in, a, in a broader sense. These large changes in heat capacity can generate free energy functions that have very marked curvature. There will be a maxima in the free energy function where the entropy change for the reaction is zero, since the derivative of free energy with respect to temperature is equal to the um, negative change in entropy. But if we continue to go below the temperature where we have this maxima in free energy, we see that the free energy is decreasing again. And this phenomenon suggests um, a um, cold denaturation or a cold unfolding temperature, if we wanted to think about this in the context of protein stability. And the larger the delta Cp, sorry, the larger the delta Cp and the smaller the enthalpy, the more curvature is um, in the free energy function and therefore the higher is this cold denaturation temperature. So here you can see um, the red curve is simulated from data um, where the melting temperature is 320 Kelvin, the enthalpy is 50 kilocals per mole, and the red function uses a heat capacity change of 1.6, the black is uh, 1.3 and the blue one. So you can see that the larger the heat capacity um, and um, the greater the curvature and therefore the higher is this potential cold melting temperature. So this has some consequences we might want to think about and interfaces in bio biomolecular complexes may often be very low enthalpy or relatively low enthalpy because they have few interactions perhaps stabilizing them but they may also have quite a high heat capacity um, because there are large changes in conformation on solvent so when complexes come together solvent is is displaced and cold inactivation of um, many multimeric enzymes and in the 70s and 80s um, there was a lot of work done on glycolytic enzymes, many of these are oligomers, and it was observed that in many cases um, there was an inactivation of these enzymes at, at low temperature, sometimes even at four degrees, so that the enzymes were more stable at 20 degrees, and this inactivation was associated with subunit dissociation. So it's always good to think, well, it's probably a good idea to keep my system in the fridge, but also maybe I should think about um, the possibility of something like this happening. Then also um, there's another um, aspect of this, and this is just thinking about how organisms might become adapted to live at higher temperatures for um, in context of thermophilic organ organisms. And Delta CP is clearly very important to this process. So if we think about our um, mesophilic organism with a melting temperature here again of 320 Kelvin and we want to elevate the melting temperature up to say 370 Kelvin nearly 100 degrees C then if we simply um, shift this whole melting curve upwards we run the risk of introducing the um, cold denaturation at temperatures that the organism may be required to go back to if we just simply increase the enthalpy of the system, then we end up at lower temperature with a system which has very high free energy. Therefore, it might become difficult to turn over. Um, and so by lowering the heat capacity, we generate a much more flattened out kind of equilibrium as a function of temperature, which may, may be uh, um, evolutionary the way that organisms could start to explore these higher, higher temperatures. So other than um, the enthalpy and the entropy, and we've seen also clearly temperature as well, and now also delta Cp can affect the equilibrium position, 
well, does anything else affect the equilibrium position? Well, yes, interestingly, many other things do. And this is because of the law of mass action, known also as Le Chatelier's principle. And this he stated as when a system at dynamic equilibrium is disturbed, the equilibrium position will shift in the direction which tends to minimize or counteract the effect of the disturbance. That doesn't particularly sound like a, a useful um, statement to use for our uh, uh, work here, but um, its implications are quite profound in that if you think about any particular interaction, in this case, say a protein-protein interaction, um, the PKAs of groups which change on complex formation so here we have a protonated group and here in the complex it's deprotonated because there's a shift in pKa between these two conformations of the free and the complex. Um, the equilibrium position is therefore changing the proton concentration, although when we do our experiments we'll be doing them in buffer um, and therefore pH will be maintained. Nevertheless, the equilibrium generates protons and therefore by mass action the proton concentration which is the pH will therefore affect the equilibrium position and this is why we have pH dependence of our processes that we're interested in stability of proteins interactions of proteins because of these differences in pKa's if there are no pKa shifts in the equilibrium then there would be no pH dependence in the equilibrium position. Here's another uh, couple of examples of how um, mass action might uh, affect our systems of interest. So in the case of an oligomer, when this unfolds to denatured monomers, there's a change in the concentration of molecules. And therefore, the position of this equilibrium or the equilibrium stability um, which represents the amount of oligomer or its melting temperature will be dependent on the concentration. So the equilibrium has affected the concentration, therefore concentration will affect the equilibrium. Here's another example when we have a protein ligand binding. Um, this, um, when we go from um, the uncomplex um, system, so we have um, the um, ligand here, and then an unfolded protein. When this binds to the folded protein, um, we see that um, there's a change in the uh, concentration of free ligand. Therefore, the equilibrium stability, um, therefore, which could be measured with the chemical stability or the melting temperature, will depend on the concentration of the ligand. And this is how thermal shift assays work in terms of, for example, screening for um, ligands that stabilize the melting temperature of proteins. So let's think about biological calorimetry. Um, and how would we go about measuring enthalpy? And we've seen that enthalpy is a major component of where our biological equilibria are going to end up. Well, under constant pressure, the heat which is transferred during a process is equal to the enthalpy. And calorimetry as a technique um, is defined as um, a, a, an area where we measure the heat. And thus, um, this is a technique that can be used to directly measure enthalpies of processes. So calorimetry can be envisaged as being uh, very useful. Um, we've already just seen that the signal in a calorimeter is the heat of a process. And the change in enthalpy, which is a direct measurement of one of the driving components of where our biological equilibria are going to end up. However, calorimetry also has a number of other advantages in that we're able to determine the value of entropy. We can't measure entropy, but if we can measure delta G and we can measure delta H and we can determine uh, the value of this. Um, it's also a very general method and all biological equilibria have associated um, enthalpy that's conformational transitions, melting, binding, interaction, turnover, enzyme, catalysis, etc. Pretty well, every biological equilibrium you can think of will have um, an associated enthalpy. And in this context, we don't need to develop 
um, a method or an assay um, in that we already know that our reaction is going to give out heat. It's also a non-optically based method and it's label free. Um, so there are no specific groups required or labels. We can use um, the chemistry in its native form. We can also use turbid suspensions or crude extracts, providing the other components don't interfere with what we're interested in. And we can use unusual solvents and high backgrounds of other molecules. So it's applicable to many, many systems. Um, and it also works across many um, scale, um, dimensions of scale from molecular interactions to cellular processes and even whole organism level. So calorimetry, not surprisingly, um, is a very wide um, subject. You can see here a variety of calorimeters. Um, this is um, Lavoisier's ice calorimeter, and this was one of the um, earliest ever experimental techniques reported in, in the literature. Um, and in this particular calorimeter, um, Lavoisier studied the respiration um, of a guinea pig, which was put inside the um, calorimeter. He measured how much heat was given off by collecting the, the ice that melted in this ice calorimeter. And he also collected how much CO2 was given off by the guinea pig. He then compared these values with the amount of heat, the amount of CO2 that he got by oxidizing carbon and concluded that respiration was a form of combustion. This is a calorimeter at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and there are other more exciting forms of calorimetry to do with determining how much energy is released if you, for example, burn um, an office um, or a car or something like that. Um, so when we think about biocalorimetry, um, the heat or the enthalpy that we might get from a typical protein-protein interaction might be about 10 kilocals per mole. So if we have 50 nanomole of that, um, of those components interacting, and that corresponds to one mil of 50 micromolar solution, this will give off about five times 10 to the minus four calories of heat. And this would end up melting six micrograms of ice or heating water by um, five times 10 to the minus four of a degree centigrade. So conventional direct heat transfer calorimetry, which is how Lavoisier um, studied um, the um, respiration, um, is not really going to be feasible, feasible in a biocalorimetry aspect. Um, as an interesting aside, Lavoisier was a sort of gentleman um, scientist, um, but his day job was um, uh, tax collecting, and this didn't go down very well during the French Revolution. And so regrettably, he was um, beheaded or guillotined during that, uh, during the revolution. So how do we, how do we think about measuring um, such small heats as we might get from biological systems using a calorimeter? And the common uh, solution to this problem is to use uh, a power compensation uh, approach. In this, we have two cells one of which contains the reaction that we're interested in, and the other is just simply a reference um, cell containing the solvent um, and being as identically dimensioned in terms of volume and um, construction as our, our sample cell. And we measure a difference in temperature, which we can measure very, very precisely with a multiple thermopile. And we try and keep that difference in temperature constant and this is done via a feedback loop here, which feeds into electrical heaters that are attached onto the um, sides of the calorimetry cell. And it's this um, feedback um, signal, which is a differential power, an excess power that we're putting in, or we can reduce the amount of power in this feedback heater loop. And then the differential power is going down so we can measure both endothermic and exothermic reactions. Um, the, this differential power, it goes through a series of calibration that's directly proportional to the excess heat 
which is taken up or given off during reactions. And this is how we measure the enthalpy. So there are two kind of types of biological um, calorimeters, the so-called isothermal titration calorimeters, which work at a particular fixed temperature, although they have a fairly wide operation range, work between four and 70 degrees C. And in these types of calorimeter, we study interactions through the titration and mixing of two molecules. One we have in the cell, one we have in the syringe. We inject the component from the syringe into the cell with, with mixing um, and observe the heat that's evolved. And the kind of equilibrium constants, dissociation constants you can measure are in the range millimole to nanomole. Um, we also have, or well, there's another area of calorimetry which was actually developed before um, ITC, and that's differential scanning calorimetry or DSC. And in this technique, we study temperature induced phase transitions, which really means melting by increasing or decreasing the temperature. Um, so we can um, study uh, the melting of proteins, nucleic acids, um, vesicles, lipids, whatever we're interested in. So one of the interesting things, and here's sort of, a, um, you've got to try and imagine this is me and as a younger scientist um, coming into the area of calorimetry and thinking, well, I can, I can actually measure the thermodynamic contributions of interactions that I see in my high resolution structures because I can mutate side chains. I can take them, um, put them in, or I can add additional interactions or remove interactions. So therefore I can just make biology do whatever I want. The problem with this naive um, assumption is that the measured heat um, that we observe in a calorimeter is a global and non-specific probe, as I've already said. And therefore, as a result, calorimetry measures the totality of heat effects from all changes that are going on in a system. And the problem with having a very structure centric view of biology is that you tend to forget that there are huge amount um, changes in solvation that we can't really observe in, in our structures. There are shifts in PKAs that we might not be aware of. And there are changes in dynamics of the system, um, which will also contribute to the enthalpy. And therefore, there are many things going on um, that we, we can't attribute simply to the change in enthalpy that we see um, if we make, uh, for example, a mutant. Calorimetry kind of highlights this fact because everything going on is going to contribute to the macroscopic enthalpy of the process. And there's also a phenomenon of enthalpy entropy compensation that confounds a rational sort of structure based thermodynamic design. If you're interested in that, I can direct you to um, further reading as quite an interesting area. So here's an example of what I've been trying to get across. Um, all our interactions that we're measuring in a calorimeter are going on in solution. Um, and therefore, when we think about two proteins interacting together, we have an observed or uh, measured enthalpy in our calorimeter. And this has components which is correspond to the enthalpy of the interaction itself, but also an enthalpy which occurs because these water molecules are hydrating the surface. And then when the surfaces come together, they get displaced out into bulk solution. So proteins only interact in vacuo in the figures of, of um, journals. Here's another example um, or an additional confounding element is, as we've already thought, um, that um, calorimetry will, or, or um, certainly pH is a, a or pH dependence is a consequence of mass action, which is thermodynamic property. But um, during interactions, buffers take up or donate protons to buffer the pH, and therefore our measured enthalpy has contributions from the interaction, contributions from the changes in solvent, but also contributions from the fact that protons are either released or taken up by the system. And these protons are then buffered um, and there is therefore a coupled equilibrium 
which is the buffer um, becoming protonated if protons are released from our system. However, this um, kind of gives us a unique angle into actually being able to measure directly protonation changes. And this is because all the buffers that we might consider using actually have different enthalpies for this process where they're taking up the um, proton. So what we need to do if we want to measure the, the net change in protonation for an interaction is just make the measurement at the same pH and salt, but using different buffers. And the slope of this, where we have an observed enthalpy as a function of buffer ionization, um, is going to give us the, the net proton flux during the interaction. Here are the tabulated values of um, buffer ionizations. Um, then because of this um, buffer ionization effect, it's important to measure that here comes another mass action effect again. That being to do with the fact that the pH of our buffers is going to change because of temperature. This is because when we a buffer ionization occurs, it produces heat, which would change the temperature of our system. And so through mass action, if we change the temperature of our system, then we're going to change the ionization of our buffer because of, buffer, uh, because of shifts in pKa. So this means that buffer pH actually depends quite strongly on temperature with the largest changes in pH occurring for buffers that have the largest enthalpy of ionization. This being TRIS being a particularly bad one. Phosphate is very good for thermal work. It's a low enthalpy of ionization. But for TRIS buffer, if we make that at 25 degrees C, at four degrees C, it's gonna be about 0.6 units, pH units higher. And at 65 degrees, it's gonna be about 1.2 pH units lower than the pH we thought it was or that, or that we made it up at, at 25 degrees C. So let's just talk about practical biocalorimetry. Bio here are the two types of calorimeter that we have available here in the LMB. The most popular is the ITC instrument in that it, 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 it's able to look at interactions and there's not so much work done on this. So I'm going to describe how you would use um, ITC, some practical tips and um, and, and comments about it. And at the end, I'll just mention a couple of interesting fact um, types of experiment you might um, consider doing with the uh, DSC. So thinking about ITC, in a typical type of ITC experiment, and this is obviously quite important information that you should read and kind of digest before approaching us um, in the biophysics facility, to consider uh, making ITC measurements with the current range of instrumentation that we have, so-called ITC 200 instrument. Um, this coming from the fact that the active cell volume is about 200 microliters. The syringe, um, which we use to inject the other component into the cell is about, uh, well, is, is 40 microliters. To do the experiment, you need about 350 microliters of target to put in the cell. This should be between 10 and 50 micromolar. Um, we don't use all of the sample, um, but we need this volume to be able to load the instrument. So you tend to consume about two, 275 microliters, you get back about 75 microliters. So for multiple experiments, you don't need that amount for every experiment you'll get some back from the first one, you can uh, recover that. For loading the syringe, we need 70 microliters, even though the um, syringe is 40 microliters in injection, that's because it has the needle and there are other filling aspects to it. And this ligand should be about 50 to 500 micromolar. So it's about five to 10 times higher than the concentration of the material that you put in the, um, in the cell about 55 microliters is consumed. And typically we would make about 15 to 20 injections of two to three microliters during an experiment to try and study the um, binding interaction. So ITC is a sample hungry technique. 
and therefore evidence of binding from other techniques or the literature is very useful before coming to make ITC measurements. Um, and because heat is a non-specific probe, as I've said a number of times, and calorimetry is going to measure the totality of all heat effects that occur when we make these injections from the syringe into the cell, we may need to make controls as well, which is also going to consume more material. Here schematically, I'm trying to show the sources of signal um, and therefore the number of controls that you might want to make. Um, if we were to just put buffer in the, in the injection syringe and sample cell and uh, make an experiment, we would actually see a very small background heat. And this comes from mechanical disturbances and very, very tiny temperature gradients within the system. So even when we inject water into water, we will still see a small signal. If we inject um, buffer into the protein, which is in the cell, so we would put buffer in the syringe and inject um, in it into the protein. This tends to be um, very, very close to this background heat because the dilution of the protein in the cell is fairly small. We're adding two microliters of buffer to 200 microliters of protein solution. We're not really diluting it very much. And therefore, um, these, this heat and this heat tend to approximate each other. However, when it comes to the ligand in the, in the syringe and we inject that into buffer, we have quite a significant dilution factor. The ligand is at quite high concentration and we inject two microliters into 200. So we change the concentration by a factor of 100. This often or sometimes means that the, um, there is an addition to this mechanical mixing, an additional heat that comes from the heat of dilution of our ligand into the uh, buffer. Then when we finally make the experiment where we inject the ligand into the protein in the cell, we get the background heat plus the heat of binding here in red. And the one that we're interested in can be obtained from this experiment um, because this heat of dilution of the material in the cell is approximately zero. Um, then therefore, if we take um, experiment four and correct it with experiment three, um, that should give us the um, overall enthalpy. So here's some typical data. Here's the control, which represents the dilution of the ligand um, into buffer. Here's the experiment, which is the injection of the ligand into the protein in the cell. And you can see that when we integrate these peaks and plot them out in this way, where we're plotting the amount of energy per mole of each injection against a molar ratio, which is a sort of a, a binding plot, which is ingrained in the ITC world. You can see that the, the heats that we get from these integrals will tend to converge when the system is fully saturated. And to fit this data um, shown as the red squares, we would correct it by subtracting away the control heats of dilution. We may also be lucky, or um, if we design our experiment in a certain way where we can observe the heat which comes from the binding interaction we completely saturate the um, protein which is in the cell with the injected ligand so that towards the end of the experiment, we're injecting the ligand into a solution of protein where no binding has occurred. So this kind of corresponds to our control background heat of dilution of the ligand. And so sometimes um, you can, in a single experiment, without making any controls, you could use this as the background, which you would subtract from the whole data set to give you this um, corrected data that you could then fit. So it's very common, and as I've, uh, I've said already, that these kind of, um, uh, sorry for that, um, these kind of representations of binding data are kind of entrenched into the, IT, the world of ITC, and you'll see them in publications everywhere. Um, 
And um, part of this is because the companies that manufacture the calorimeters give easy to use software that allow you to fit the data in, in these particular forms. So you can see this particular data has been fit and uh, fit to a simple model of n sites, some number of sites with identical affinity and enthalpy, gives us this series of parameters here. Um, and a uh, number of sites, 0.7, um, an association constant, 3 to the 6, KD, which corresponds to a KD of 330 nanomole, and then the enthalpy is minus 6.8 kilocals. With these parameters, we can then calculate the free energy of the interaction. We can also determine the entropy of the interaction. So what do we do with this data? First of all, just totally disregard the errors that you're getting here and the suggested precision of these fitted values. This is purely a curve fitting exercise. If you come to the talk that we give later on, um, where we talk in more depth about curve fitting, um, we will go over this fact um, that it's very common in non-linear least squares fitting packages that an unnecessary amount of precision is implied um, in the curve fit. You can also transpose um, these data into a more conventional type of binding curve where you would have the total amount of heat as a cumulative sum against the amount of added ligand. And you could fit the data in any, any particular package that you have or using your own equations. Just because the data are often displayed in this unusual format, it doesn't mean that the binding data are any different from any other process, such as Stephen described um, in the talk on fluorescence. So in terms of optimizing your ITC experiment and what information content we have, when we look at data of this form, we have information about the um, enthalpy, which is effectively the intercept of this um, um, heat function, um, the integrated amount of heat per mole of um, injected material on the, um, on the y-axis. We have information about the affinity and the stoichiometry, because this is a molar ratio. Um, here in this region where we, trans, um, we transfer from a, a system where everything is binding to a system where nothing is binding. And then, as I said before, particularly um, if you're able to do an experiment in this way, you have information about the endpoint, which will represent the control heat of dilution and should be subtracted away from the data. So these kind of plots can be um, described by a parameter which um, is very popular in the ITC community again, and it's known as the C value. What the C value is, is simply the protein concentration or whatever your target is that you've put into the cell divided by the KD of the system. So it's how many times above the KD is your protein concentration. And the optimal range for ITC, if you're trying to obtain KD, stoichiometry and enthalpy in one single experiment, would be to have a C value between 10 and 500. And you can see how modulating um, the value of C here between 1000 and 0 0.01 changes the shape of your binding curve. At very high C value, you have very little information about the affinity because you, but very uh, constrained information about the stoichiometry because the affinity is equal or proportional to the slope of this kind of transition. Um, at very low C value, you have very little features in the data and obviously um, it will tend to end up as a straight line eventually. So in the previous fit, um, the, the fitted value of the number of sites that we have in this um, binding model was 0.7. So you're probably already thinking, well, what does, how can you have a fractional number of sites? So N is technically the number of sites that we have in our system. 
or the stoichiometry of interaction. And it's obviously well determined when you have a high C value or a very tight binding and you're working many times above KD. But in extracting this stoichiometry, you're assuming that the concentration of your macromolecules in both the cell and in the ligand in the syringe are measured correctly. Not only that, you're assuming you have no measurement error in determining concentrations, but you're also assuming that they're 100% pure and 100% native or binding competent. So N and um, the other fitted values of enthalpy and entropy are actually particularly sensitive to errors in, the um, in your concentrations. This is the result of having an error in the cell concentration. You see that you affect the stoichiometry very strongly. When you think about errors of the concentration of the component in the syringe, you can see that you affect the stoichiometry very strongly, the KD also very strongly, and the enthalpy very strongly. So therefore, um, given the choice, you should consider putting um, the component that you're able to best quantify um, into the cell because that has least contributions in terms of errors. And then also because one can see that both errors in the cell concentration and errors in the syringe concentration affect the stoichiometry, the value of N, which turned out to be fractional in our fit, can also be viewed as an indicator of binding site concentration. Or simply what we're doing is we're just putting in an additional parameter into our fitting equations that allow us to get a really nice fit and the data goes through the points. So what we're doing is we're allowing concentration errors to be floated during our fitting process. So in practice, when we're looking or expecting a stoichiometry of one, one-to-one -one binding, then um, uh, values between 0.8 and 1.2 are pretty well equivalent to a value of one, because we have to accept that we may have five to 10% error in determining measuring concentration, and then possibly some fraction of binding incompetent material. Um, obviously, n values of 0.5 or 2 have some other potential meaning in multiple sites or a dimer binding, and we've quantified concentration in terms of the monomer. So then going back to this C value, um, we're um, preoccupied or we uh, would like to get C value between 10 and 500. Um, and so when we come to trying to measure tight or weak binding, um, when the KD is very low because of tight binding, this would require reducing the protein concentration to make sure we aren't too far above KD. But um, the problem comes in that once we go below about five micromolar of material in the cell, given an average enthalpy, which is the total amount of heat that we're going to measure, um, then we run out of sensitivity in terms of being able to measure that heat above background. And this kind of limits our lower um, measurement of KD to about 100 nanomole. However, because um, um, calorimetry is a, a non-optical technique um, and you can do multiple titrations, you can put whatever you want into the cell. So you could put a preformed complex into the cell or you could do one titration, um, one binding titration, remove the syringe, fill it with a second tighter binding component and do a displacement binding experiment. So ITC is perfect for these displacement type approaches. And using that approach, you can measure very, very tight KDs of picomole or below. <coughs> when it comes to thinking about weak binding, um, then that would require interesting, increasing, sorry, the protein concentration beyond a, a reasonable amount of material that you might be able to produce. Um, and so often these titrations for weak binding systems have to be necessarily done at low C value. And these can be done if you do appropriate control heats of dilution 
um, and are very careful with these control heats and correct the data using them. There are some references here that talk about using ITC for tight binding and weak binding, uh, which will give more details on those. So ITC, can we use it for anything else um, other than just measuring enthalpies, stoichiometries and KDs? Well, yes, we can actually. So we've already thought about um, how there are large changes in heat capacity. Um, and because of this relation of enthalpy being the, um, uh, sorry, the heat capacity change being the derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature, we can obtain this value simply by measuring the enthalpy at a function of different temperatures. And rigid body type interactions, so where there are no major conformational changes, tend to have a large and negative delta Cp of interaction binding, which is proportional to the surface area of the interacting um, surfaces. If we see non-constant variation, so not a linear function, uh, um, we're, when changing temperature, or we get a very large value of delta Cp or a positive value, um, then this tends to indicate that there are coupled conformational events um, coupling to the binding itself. Um, this may be um, folding upon binding, so thinking about intrinsically disordered um, systems or, or major domain movements such as clamshell type enzymes. We also pointed out earlier on um, that using um, the different buffers allows us to determine the um, protonation flux going on during our, in, our binding interaction. So measuring delta Cp and measuring the protonation changes, there are additional um, physical parameters that can be determined beyond um, simple binding experiments. Sometimes when we're doing control heats, um, we can see a non-linear and non-constant control um, observed when we inject whatever we have in the syringe into buffer. Um, and this usually um, is a sign that we have some sort of dissociation or association, which is driven by the dilution of um, our sample from the syringe because of this roughly hundredfold dilution. And in fact, if we have systems which undergo dissociation and these data are obtained from a coiled coil system, we can actually fit this data by integrating these heats, which are a signal of the, the extent of dissociation um, to a dimer disso dissociation model and get the KD for the dissociation process. And again, I think I said this earlier in the context of concentration. So if you have the choice, put the component that you're um, most un, uh, the least able to quantify in the cell, you should also, given the choice, put the system with the higher molecularity component in the cell, because this then avoids the material in the cell, the concentration doesn't change so much, unless you're specifically interested in this process. So ITC is a technique where we're measuring heat um, with an instrument and that heat is arriving at the um, sensors or we're changing the temperature between the two cells measured with the thermopile um, as a function of time. And when the heat, the rate of heat, which is coming from our chemistry um, becomes slower than the instrumental response of the instrument, then we start to see that the injection peaks become broadened. Um, so when the observed um, kinetics of, our, of an interaction, which are determined by the sum of the on rate um, multiplied by the constant of the free components um, and the off rate multiplied by the concentration of the complex, when this becomes slower than the instrumental response function, we see this broadening of peaks. It's very common to see this in, in, in most ITC data. And normally this occurs when the system tends to saturate because K on becomes very slow 
because of a limited number of um, free sites um, on the component that's in the cell. And there's um, a software um, called Kin ITC, and you can go to this um, URL and have a look at the company that's promoting this kind of approach. And this tends, what they try to do is to extract the K on and the K off. So they're actually trying to get the kinetic uh, parameters as well as the bind the equilibrium binding parameters. You can also consider using um, ITC um, at, for looking at enzyme kinetics um, and potentially, as I said earlier, because of its non-optical nature, it's pretty well a universal method for all um, enzyme or, or enzyme reactions. In this case, you have micromole of enzyme um, and you make very long duration injections to make sure you completely turn over the substrate that you inject in. And so this allows you to get the enthalpy in this experiment with this configuration, the enthalpy per mole of turning over the substrate by the enzyme. Then when you want to look at the um, actual process, you use much lower enzyme concentration and a short duration and you're looking at this initial deflection in heat signal um, and taking that level to be uh, uh, an indicator of the rate of the enzyme reaction turnover. Here you can see it, the ITC data compare very well with a classical optical um, method, um, giving um, KCAT and KM for this enzymic reaction. So just to mention in the last minutes, DSC. Um, so the instrument is based around the same principle of power compensation, but in this case, we're scanning the temperature of both of the cells up at some predefined um, scanning rate. Um, and with this instrument um, that we have, uh, we can scan between 0 0.1, two and a half degrees per minute. Uh, we can go above 100 degrees C because the sample is pressurized slightly so we apply a slight positive pressure on top of the sample so it doesn't boil and you can see here here's some example of some um, um, proteins unfolding uh, at different ph's you can build up a ph kind of um, melt um, relation here and um, under optimal conditions we would get the tm and the enthalpy um, under whatever conditions we were studying or perhaps we'd made mutants of our wild type protein. So here's again, um, an example of mass action where we're adding um, a ligand, which is binding to the native state of this particular protein. Um, this is ribonuclease and we're adding um, CMP. You can see that the melting temperature is increasing because through mass action, we're driving the equilibrium in this direction by increasing the ligand concentration. Here's an example of a ligand which has a higher affinity for the denatured protein, in this case cyclodextrin, um, and so therefore as we increase the concentration of cyclodextrin we see the melting temperature decrease. So again mass action effects but it allows us to get mechanistic information about what's going on. And finally here's a particularly interesting area where um, in the DSC instrument, people studied um, plasma um, from, in this case, humans, and they were, um, plasma contains hun literally hundreds of proteins. And one would never consider putting this um, into an uh, instrument to try and measure the properties of these proteins to just such, such a, a complex um, um, sample to study. But when um, these, uh, this group looked at normal plasma um, from a, a, variety, a number of individuals. They saw that actually the DSC profile, the melting, was fairly reproducible amongst these individuals. And when they looked at the individual components, which are known to be present in plasma, they saw that the melting temperatures of these um, proteins studied individually could be added together based on their known composition in typical plasma to give a very similar profile. 
So in this case, the dotted line is the sum of the individual proteins that were studied one at a time and then added together to give this composite DSC melting curve. So the interesting part of all of this is that when they looked at plasma from um, patients who had a, rain, a, a very strange range of um, diseases and um, some of them having cancer, they found that the, the profiles that they saw um, under DSC were quite different from the um, normal um, human uh, or the, the um, normal control measurement. In this case, this yellow one, which is really very bizarre, was somebody who had Lyme's disease. And um, this, this area of work has been um, continued at, at some considerable length. People have looked at a variety of other um, biological solutions, cerebrospinal fluid, urine. And, and the argument that people are making is that um, it's not that the levels of the proteins are changing within the plasma of these individuals, but that as a result of the disease process, there are very low levels of disease markers in the bloodstream. And these disease markers bind and interact with the plasma proteins. And again, as a result of mass action, by binding to these proteins, they stabilize them or they alter their stability. And this is what's causing this change in the plasma profile. Quite an interesting area and um, follow the reference here or just have a look at plasma and DSC in the literature. So to summarize then, calorimetry is, these are the sort of take home uh, messages. Calorimetry is label free and it's a very general method which can be applied to all biological equilibria. So it's not just a technique used for proteins. We can study nucleic acids, uh, vesicles. We can study whole cells um, pl and plasma, for example. In the context of ITC, we're mainly considering binding, um, although there were those other applications. And from binding, we can get the KD, we can get a stoichiometry, the enthalpy, and therefore we can also extract the entropy change. If we want, we can extend our measurements to include temperature, get the delta CP of interaction. We could also get the change in protonation during an interaction. The DSC um, is used mainly for thermal stability. So we extract a TM where delta G is zero, an enthalpy for the process. We can get the delta CP of binding. We can get a so-called Van Hoff enthalpy and we can also access protonation changes, again, using different buffers. Changes in TM because of mass action, as you saw with D, um, DSC, are indicative of ligand binding. So either it increases the stability or decreases the stability, depending on whether um, it binds to the native or the denatured state. But there are many other uses, as I tried to just illustrate very quickly for ITC and DSC aggregation, dissociation, enzyme kinetics, diagnostics, et cetera. And then perhaps the key take home message is that enthalpy and entropy cannot be interpreted mechanistically, or one should be extremely careful in doing this, because when you make these measurements, you're observing many, many contributions from solvation, dynamics, protonation, and basically everything that's going on in your sample. And you don't see these in structures and so making a mechanistic inclusion can be quite risky. Here are some references of work that we've published where we've used either DSC or ITC. Um, and then here's um, a reference um, of a chapter that I, I have um, written, which is in this book, which I also edited. Um, and I've given a copy of this book to the LMB library. So the book's in the library. Um, and this is obviously quite a current review on um, ITC. So if you have any questions, I can see one in the Q&A. So, um, okay. so we have a question here. Are covalent inhibitors possible to analyze accurately with ITC? And if so, how do they behave? Um, if you're talking about formation of a covalent um, 
interaction as a result of, for example, mixing two components together, then of course this is possible to measure with um, ITC or, or, or any type of calorimeter because that process will have an associated enthalpy. I have to admit that I've not um, been involved in any study where there's been covalent binding um, into the binding site. One possibility is that formation of covalent bonds are likely to be highly energetic and therefore one would need to make some initial measurements to make sure that the observed changes or adjust concentrations so that observed changes were um, uh, on scale that the instrument could still measure those changes accurately. In the ITC is designed to measure extremely small heats, it has an upper limit of how much heat it can accurately measure and one would be, need to be careful that you didn't exceed that amount. So I'm assuming that the covalent inhibitor is perhaps some sort of sacrificial um, ligand that then reacts with a, a, a group in the binding site. So I think the answer would be yes. Um, I could envisage it's definitely possible. Um, have a look in the literature um, and if you can't find anything then get back to me. Um, and then we have another question, as ITC measures the total heat change in the system, if I see a change of a wild type and a mutant, how to find out whether this change is induced by the mutation or PKA, solvation, etc. Do I have to do a control of different buffers? Um, Obviously, um, what I've tried to emphasize is that the measured enthalpy is the sum of many different contributions, which come from many different elements of the biological interaction. But what we're interested in in determining the equilibrium constant is under these conditions, where does the equilibrium end up? That is what determines the biological effect. So. It's not a question of you needing to access the inherent in vacuo enthalpy of interaction of two components. It's just bearing in mind that when you make the measurement, it's coming from everything that's happening within the system. So I think, you know, I, well, I think maybe this helps to answer your question is that, um, the wild type and the mutant will have contributions from these processes that you can't deconvolve from your total signal. But what you're interested in is how the mutation has affected the equilibrium position. Obviously, if you then make a mutation where you specifically remove a charged group from your interacting, um, uh, from, from some interaction that you visualize in a structural interface, then it might be interesting to consider using different buffers to see whether or not the enthalpy of ionization, uh, sorry, the, um, the change in protonation has changed um, on, on, as a result of the mutation, which would give you a feeling about how much PKA shift there was for the original group that you mutated in the wild type interaction. So you do not have to make measurements in different buffers because you're going to report the result, which is where the equilibrium constant was in under those particular conditions of temperature, pH and the buffer that you used. However, if someone else then looks at your paper, they decide to make a different use a different buffer, they may well measure a different enthalpy. And this is why it's difficult to interpret the enthalpy and the entropy. Um, hopefully that kind of answers your question. If not, come and see me and we can talk more. So any more questions at all? Otherwise, uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, hopefully see you next time.